Blog Talk Radio. begin right now. From high atop the mountains of British Columbia to you listening around the world, this is Spaced Out Radio. You can follow us on our website, spacedoutradio.com, on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can follow us on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R, or on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride as we are live on Spaced Out Radio. As we come in from the frozen Canadian tundra, battle our way past the wild animals, sidestep Bigfoot, and enter Uncle Jimbo's cabin, stoke the fire, heat this place up, and broadcast you live on this Thursday night, early Friday morning if you're on the East Coast. Here at SOR, we do this thing seven days a week. We want to be your official one-stop shop when it comes to the supernatural, cryptozoological, paranormal, spiritual, and so much more. Spaced Out Radio's theme music is courtesy of guitar god Ron Bumblefoot Ball. You can find his new album, Little Brother is Watching, by going to spaceoutradio.com. If you're a social media junkie like I am, follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can also join us on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. And our new look website is spacedoutradio.com. At this time, we love sending a shout out to our fans listening in Paranormal Into the Night, Paranormal Forum, and the Spaced Out Radio chat room. Hey, if you go to our website, spacedoutradio.com, you can click on Cat's Corner. Psychic Catherine Fallman will answer one lucky listener's submitted question per week. Tonight's show is brought to you by Rivulet Reiki and Readings, providing healings in person or in a distance. Space Out Radio listeners receive a 10% discount on pricing. Spirit Story Box, the official ghost hunting app of Space Out Radio. It's only found on the iPhone. The new Agora newspaper has everything you need when it comes to politics, health, supernatural, paranormal, and so much more. And purpleplates.com help heal your body, mind, and soul. Drop into their site and heal yourself today. The Crypto Guru is back tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Yes, it's that time of the month where our resident expert on all things weird hanging out in the forest joins us for his monthly appearance. Author Ronald Murphy has grown into one of the most popular guests on this show when it comes to his knowledge of creatures like Dogman and Bigfoot. But where he really steps up to the plate and crushes it is when we delve into the land of the Fae. And since he's Irish and it's St. Patrick's Day, and it's little Ronnie O'Murphy's birthday on Sunday, we're even happy that even members of ISIS are donning the green clothes and red beers, getting into the green beer as well tonight, as Murphy comes out swinging with what he knows about leprechauns and the land of the Fae. 
Ron's books on the Fae can be found on Amazon. He will also tell us about how the land of the Fae extends to the different worlds from fairies to trolls under bridges. It's going to be an awesome show, so buckle up, space travelers, as the crypto guru is back. Ronald Murphy joins us. Ron, thank you so much for being here. How are you, birthday boy? I am doing great, my friend. I hope you and everybody else listening are doing fine as well. I had a great St. Patrick's Day because it's now over here on the East Coast. But you guys, I guess, still have a couple more hours left. You have a couple of more hours to get into the green swill. That's because <laughs> it is still St. Patty's Day here on the West Coast. And you still got, I believe, four hours left until Hawaii passes that time. That's so right. That's you're still right. fine. Plenty of time, plenty of time. How you been? I have been doing well. I've been writing a lot. I've got a lot of uh, deadlines coming up. I uh, have uh, three books due with the publishers uh, within a month. So I I was able to complete all of those deadlines, thank the good Lord. And then I'm I'm working on one other thing, and then it's just – it's just a lot of work, my friend. I'm, I'm feeling kind of stressed, so whenever I see that I'm going to be appearing on Space Out Radio, uh, all the stress goes away because this is the time whenever I'm actually having the most fun. So, hey, I appreciate these little respites. Ron, being of Irish descent, what does St. Patrick's Day really mean for the Irish? Oh, uh, well, so the thing is that that's a, 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 an excellent, excellent question because to me and to my uh, my family, whenever I was growing up, uh, my father's uh, is a Murphy, of course, but my mother was a Murray. So we, I had all this great influx of uh, of different uh, traditions coming to me. Uh, so it was a, a big meat and potato family, but uh, we never saw St. Patrick's Day. At a time whenever, you know, there would be uh, a lot of drinking and everything because it came from a really uh, Catholic family. So we saw this as a time whenever we could rally around the great, uh, uh, the, the solidarity of our faith, I think. And that's what St. Patrick's Day uh, always has meant to me. And it wasn't until I was in college to have meant something totally different. But, uh, yes, I mean, this is one of my favorite holidays because uh, it, it's, it's kind of like a, a Christmas and an Easter rolled up in one for us. Now, I know the Irish like to fight. They like the green <laughs> beer and they like to fight. Is fighting permitted between the Irish on St. Patrick's Day? <laughs> it was like a kind of like yeah, an Olympics whenever everything would come to a halt. Hey, in my family, fighting was uh, permitted every single day. So I'm thinking that, it, that there was no prohibition against it. But, uh, you know, it, it's odd that you mentioned that because I'm working on a, a book on uh, on ghosts right now of uh, – the uh, uh, part of my uh, country over here up in, uh, in western Pennsylvania. And uh, there was a lot of industry over here, and uh, they, they needed immigrants to fill the jobs. So during whenever they were putting in the uh, railroad in the, uh, in the uh, 1800s, uh, the, the, the companies would actually go over to Ireland and recruit entire towns and bring them over just to supply enough manpower. And uh, on two different occasions, uh, the company went over there and uh, grabbed up towns and uh, put them into almost like work camps uh, without the realization that some of these towns didn't get along with each other. So on two different occasions, uh, there were these great uh, uh, acts of gang violence between uh, Irish factions right here in uh, in good old Western Pennsylvania. Whenever they were working on the uh, on the railroad, and deaths occurred, uh, people had talked about uh, taking the uh, the the the, the pickaxe off of the uh, the axe and using the handle as a shillelagh. Uh, priests were called in from outlying uh, towns to come in and stop the violence. So the Irish like to fight no matter what. And and that's the thing is they, they're, they're proud about their heritage. They're proud of who they are. And uh, just like the little fighting Irish guy on the uh, Notre Dame uh, football, hey, they'll put up a fight if anybody messes with them. We are talking with the crypto guru tonight, Ronald Murphy. We're calling him Little Ronnie Murphy <laughs> for 
St. Patrick's Day as he is Irish, and he's going to be a birthday boy here on Sunday, which happy birthday to you from all of us here at Spaced Out Radio and from all of our listeners. Well, I appreciate that. I so when it comes, that. Ron, when it comes to being Irish, everybody has heard of the leprechaun. I mean, if you go down the cereal aisle, you have Frosted Lucky Charms because they're magically delicious. <laughs> and there's all sorts of people who hop on the bandwagon when it comes to St. Patty's Day. And realistically, like you mentioned, Notre Dame, where they have the Fighting Irish and a little leprechaun as their team mascot. What is the importance of the leprechaun when it comes to Ireland and the Irish? Well, it is uh, a symbol, isn't it? Um, It works well with things like tourism. It's a a personification of uh, what uh, Ireland uh, pagan spirituality means because you can have this little leprechaun figure being the mascot for a very Catholic university. So it's kind of like a melding of the two different uh, religions. And that is really one of the things that I really take uh, pride in with my Irish heritage, that you know we can be staunchly Roman Catholic, but we can also accept that there are things out there that are not quite explained, and fairies can be very real. And uh, that's what the leprechaun, t- to me, represents. Um, it's great for tourism. It's, uh, it's appealing to kids. Uh, they make great cereal. And uh, I just, uh, it, I, whenever you told me what the topic was going to be, I thought, you know what, I cannot really wait to dive into this. Because whenever we think about the leprechaun, it's not an ancient Figure. So, if you would go back to you know the the into like the first century BC, and you would have went over to Ireland, they probably would not have had a leprechaun as part of their their pantheon of all the different uh, nature uh, deities that existed. Um, obviously, he was embedded within the culture um, in the eighth century. Uh, we start finding the use of something like a leprechaun, and it was a water spirit. And now the idea of the name leprechaun is where it comes from is also very ambiguous. Some people think that it means a uh, little person, small-bodied, but it, it, pro- it probably is a um, uh, an amalgamation of different type of ideas. Uh, whenever you're talking about uh, the leprechaun, um, there's there's some people think that the word leprechaun means uh, is a derivative of the of an old word meaning shoemaker. So even even the name leprechaun is kind of nebulous and lost to us in, in relation to its origin. But um, so he's 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 a relatively new figure in the world of the Fae, but his aspects and his attributes are are very very ancient. We are talking with the crypto guru on Spaced Out Radio tonight, Ronald Murphy, or Little Ronnie O'Murphy, since it is St. Patrick's Day, and we're going to be talking about leprechauns in the land of the Fae. Ron, for people who may not have heard of you on this show before and new to our listeners, how did you become such an expert on the land of the Fae? Because you really are the man to go to when it comes to anything to do with the fairies. Uh, you know what? Yeah, uh, I uh, stumbled upon it uh, whenever I was in graduate school. Um, I've always had an interest in the other world, uh, but I was actually uh, I studied history in graduate school, and um, I was working on um, uh, a Renaissance paper of all things. And I was also uh, have been a big fan of Shakespeare, so I kind of wanted to have a paper that dealt with the history of the Renaissance England, as well as you know one of my favorite subjects in William Shakespeare. So uh, I, I was starting to do all this research about how I could you know form this 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 this, this final paper for the semester, and uh, I was going to think about doing things on you know kingship and uh, the things upon uh, 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 Renaissance warfare. But I kept on coming back to this reoccurring theme of fairies. 
and I thought that this is this is relatively uh, astounding because a lot of people weren't talking about this in uh, mainstream academia. But as I got more and more entrenched into the lore of the fairy, it was all pervasive. I mean, it, it, it was something if you would go back, you know, a thousand years, two thousand years, or even into into the dim past of the Celts, there was always this idea of the fairy world, and it extended well up into the Renaissance, and you can see it in Shakespeare's play A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is a great play to read for anybody that has any interest in the in, in the crypto world of the goblin universe, as I like to call it. it. It's just an amazing play that really encompasses all the notions of what a fairy meant to the Renaissance imagination. But I decided to write a paper on it, and it's it, so it, I had more questions than answers after writing this paper, and that was probably um, what twenty years ago, I guess. So I've been uh, studying uh, the, the world of the Fae now for uh, about two decades, and whenever I uh, start studying into other crypto. Uh, uh, Creatures such as Bigfoot and Dogman, I start finding that there are parallels to these creatures' existence as well as you know that 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 ambiguous world of the fairy. And I, I've I'm still studying it even to this day. How did you find that correlation between creatures like Bigfoot and the land of the fairies? Well, they have similar. Um, uh, similar interactions with our world. Uh, Bigfoots have been known to um, be seen at one moment and then disappear. Uh, they are known to communicate by wood knocking. And then I'm finding out that, you know, fairies around the world, there, there is reports of, uh, of a, a knocking fairy in, uh, in uh, Germany actually called a knocker that would, uh, would knock in the woods and people would think that the woods were haunted by um, a fairy rather than a Bigfoot because of the knocking sounds. Oh, our little friend, the leprechaun, that we'll be talking about tonight, one of his attributes as well is uh, the hammering in of nails. So people would report uh, hearing a leprechaun if they would hear knocking in the woods. Same thing as, uh, as, as our friend, the Bigfoot. Uh, Dogman as well. The idea of shape-shifting, of going from one form of being into another, is typical of the world of the Fae. And not only that, in Wexford, uh, Ireland, uh, as it is St. Patrick's Day, I'll focus on Ireland, um, there is a fairy there, uh, a puka, that has been known to uh, uh, shapeshift into a giant bird very similar to what we here have, uh, the Thunderbird. So it is an amalgamation of all these different uh, types of characteristics of the cryptids that we talk about. Uh, but it's all entrenched in the world of the fairy. And I think as researchers now that we need to at least consider that uh, whenever we're delving into the world of the cryptid, that there might be another dimension uh, to these creatures, that they are actually from another dimension, as a matter of fact, that they're from another world that every now and then seep into our own world. So when we're talking about not being able to get conclusive evidence, such as bodies or fuzzy photographs and things, this might be the reason. The reason we're not getting anything conclusive is they don't actually belong to this world. They, they interlap with our world. Occasionally they, they interact with it. But for the most part, um, it's a, a different overlying dimension. And science has proven this. That there are dimensions upon dimensions. And, uh, and, and it's, to me, as a, uh, as a researcher that likes to, uh, to be very scientific, uh, in case there's any kind of uh, scrutiny of my work, uh, I, I think that delving into something like the fairy and talking about subatomic sub particles and things of that nature, things that we don't see, we can see, but we know they exist, uh, is something that I really am cherishing as a researcher. And, uh, and yeah, I'm just loving it. Loving every bit of it, Dave. <laughs> How did you then figure out, or do you believe, Ron, that the fairies are either interdimensional or of some sort of alien descent? And when yes, I say aliens, I'm not saying up in space. I'm right. saying just 
uh, some sort of alien descent. Absolutely, and, and um, it, it's good that you pointed that out because that's the other thing that I that I like to uh, to study as well too. The idea of of an alien not being extraterrestrial, but uh, ultra terrestrial. You know that 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 they are they are of this realm, but beyond it. That that they are the, the, these creatures are of this world. But in a different dimension, if that makes any sense, I know that, that that sometimes doesn't make any sense whenever I talk about it. But if I if I can just take a few moments here to to discuss it, please do. Um, yeah. So whenever we talk about uh, the world of uh, aliens and the world of the fairies and how they overlap, uh, it was in the Renaissance whenever uh, 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 a reverend by the name of Kirk uh, had an encounter with what he knew were fairies. He knew it implicitly that they were fairies because this was the background in which he was working. He was walking through the forest, came across a, a hill, uh, saw a light coming out of a door on the hill. Immediately he knew that it was a fairy world. He looked in. He saw you know two different types of beings, a very tall being and um, these short little gray beings, which sound um, completely like an encounter with the grays and an encounter with the uh, with what we would call the Nordics, but he knew that they were fairies because that was his background. Now, we as human beings like to form reality within our minds, what we can grasp. So we are a technological people now. So if we have an experience like that, we are not going to call it fairy. We're going to call it alien because we are of that background now. We're a computerized society. We know how things work. We're not rustic anymore. But it's my contention that all of these things are of the same being, that it is a, 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 a something that's not traveling light years to get here, but it's traveling dimensions to get here. From, from it's, it's like stepping through a door. And I do believe that these doors from one world to the other do exist. Uh, if you look into fairy lore, you, they talk about um, fairy rings. And fairy rings have a great similarity to um, sacred sites around the world, like Avebury and like Stonehenge. We have these very circular type of, uh, of uh, constructions around places where fairies are notoriously said to exist. Even in the Americas, we have round structures like mounds. Uh, and I, I'm thinking, and my research is continuing, that when we talk about things like ray lines and natural earth energy points, that fairies are able to use these points to step from one reality into the other reality. And ancient man knew this, so they constructed um, – uh, edifices to signify where these c certain power points were, and um, you know you could they either use them for healing or use them for astronomy, but they always use them for something that was uh, uh, beyond them. So in these sacred sites were used to uh, go above and beyond what the human mind was capable of doing in everyday life. So people gathered here for great things. And I think the reason they gathered there for great things is because there was a natural power inherent in the land, and that traces the whole way back to the world of the ferry. We are talking with the crypto guru tonight on Space Out Radio, Ronald Murphy, or since it's St. Patty's Day, we're calling him, Little Ronnie O'Murphy tonight on Spaced Out Radio. He is our crypto guru. We are talking about fairies. We are talking about leprechauns. And we're going to get more into the leprechaun side of things when we get to the break. Ron, we only got a couple minutes before we actually have to step out to the break. Have you noticed in your research then, because we talk about them possibly being interdimensional or some sort of alien type feature have there ever been any studies or have you looked into the idea that a lot of these leprechaun or fairy sightings happen around portals yeah that's uh, uh, excellent so when we talk about um alien encounters they usually happen outside of the civilized world don't they when we talk about people being abducted it's usually on back roads it's usually someplace removed from civilization now 
that's the realm of the fairy, isn't it? I mean, fairies, by very definition, uh, as we see in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, live outside of human influence. So whenever these things are occurring, they are occurring outside of the human domain. So I found that very curious whenever I was going and researching and studying. But when we talk about um, uh, encounters with, with extraterrestrials, as we would call them, um, in, uh, in Scotland, Stirling, uh, Scotland, there are a great many UFO sightings there, and that is right where uh, Reverend Kirk was abducted back in the Renaissance. So we do have this, this idea of seeing strange things happening in conjunction with the places where fairies are said to roam. The famous site of Barney and Betty Hill up in New Hampshire is also in an area very near to where there is great many sightings of things like puck wedgies and uh, other little small creatures that if you were to take them out of a North American environment and you would insert them into a, a European environment, they would immediately be called fairies rather than the, than the typical cryptid that you would notice them. But uh, yeah, I, I definitely, these most sightings that we're seeing and most abduction stories are taking place in the realm of what I would call the fairy. They take place in the woods. They take place outside of, uh, of human habitation. And the reason is that is where uh, fairies tend to, to troop, as, as to use a word uh, from the uh, fairy lingo, trooping. And that's where they dwell, and that's where they, they make their home. And uh, they do not uh, really uh, interfere with us until we invade their space. We are talking with the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, tonight on Spaced Out Radio. He is a very talented author. You can find any of his books on Amazon.com, as well his Facebook author page. Just type in Ronald J. Murphy, make that Ronald L. Murphy Jr. in Facebook, and you'll get his author page as well. Support that one. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be right back after our first break of the night. This is Patrick Webster Small, and I'm going to bring you the Webster Phenomena right here on Spaced Out Radio, Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. Every week, I'm going to bring you the freshest information on the globe. I'm bringing you guys the truth, extraterrestrials in the sky, prophecy, chemtrails, rainbow spot, the seventh angel, biblical skies, ancient gods, ghosts, spirits, see it, hear it. So let's do this every Monday night. I'll see you back here at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Did you know that Spaced Out Radio is live seven days a week? This is Jim Tyson, host of Spaced Out Weekend. You can listen to my show, Spaced Out Weekend, every Saturday and Sunday night starting at 1 a.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific. On Spaced Out Weekend, we like to delve into the paranormal, even the newest technologies that have enhanced modern-day ghost hunting. And sometimes, we'll get a little creative and dabble into the crypto world, UFOs, and much, much more. So tune in at www.spacedoutradio.com on the weekends and listen to me, Jim Tyson, on Spaced Out Weekend. Hi there, this is Jolene with Rivula Reiki and Reading, and I want you to relax. Let me help you chill out and get in touch with your body, mind, and soul. In this busy world, sometimes we need to let go, and this is where I can help. Visit my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivuletrnr, 
or my Facebook page, Rivulet R&R, to set up an appointment for relaxation, Reiki, or readings, no matter where you are. Spaced Out Radio listeners will also receive 10% off their first visit. It's time for you to make time for you. The Spaced Out Radio Network can be found at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott. Here you can join the latest on our weekly shows and news from around the world involving UFOs, cover-ups, cryptids, ghosts, and more. Read articles from our very talented staff and check out our weekly tarot card reading from psychic Catherine. You can also sign up for free on our forum and tell us about your experiences. SpacedOutRadio.com. Always live, always interactive. Ready to find out what's flying up in the sky? Me too. Hi there, this is Rich Giordano. Please join me every Sunday night at 7 for the AZ UFO Show. It's a fast and compelling two-hour show on UFOs, extraterrestrials, conspiracy theories, and much more. Every week we will have great guests and great topics to try and answer the ultimate question, are we alone in this universe or not? So tune in to the AZ UFO Show with me, Rich Giordano, right here on the Spaced Out Radio Network at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to connect with Dave and his guests? Learn more at spacedoutradio.com for the latest news, features, photos, and articles. Spacedoutradio.com is where you can stay up to date on what's happening around the world and up in the stars. And now, back to Dave Scott. Welcome back for the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you to everyone who is tuning in in the Spaced Out Radio chat room, Paranormal Into the Night, and Paranormal Forum. We appreciate your love and your support as Spaced Out Radio is growing. I do want to remind you that as of either March 21st or as late as March 28th, both are Mondays, we will be moving this show from Blog Talk Radio over to Spreaker. It's a better sound. We have the audio almost all in place. Once we have the audio in place, which I'm hoping by this weekend, we will officially make the move. And on April 18th, we are moving Spaced Out Radio from two hours to three hours. So instead of being on 1 to 3 a.m. Eastern, which would be 10 p.m. to midnight Pacific, we are going to be going midnight till 3 a.m. Eastern and 9 p.m. until midnight Pacific. More entertainment, more value for you. Some more exciting announcements will be coming down through Spaced Out Radio very, very soon. Hey, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can also ask to join Spaced Out Radio's group as well as Podcast Central. On Instagram, I can be followed as Dave Scott, S-O-R. Our YouTube channel is Spaced Out Radio Show, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. Tomorrow night, we finish off the week with Jim Vieira. We're going to be talking about the lost colony of Roanoke. He's an expert researcher on the topic. It's going to be fun tomorrow night on Spaced Out Radio. Tonight, though, it is St. Patty's Day still here on the West Coast. So we bring in little Ronnie O'Murphy, the crypto guru, back into Space Out Radio Land as we are talking everything fairy tonight, including leprechauns. Ron, welcome back to the show. Hey, thank you very much, my friend. Thank you. And I'm trying to keep up with all these guys here asking questions and everything. Your uh, your uh, radio audience, as I've said before, is uh, one of the most intelligent groups of people that I've ever had a chance to run into. So it's always a pleasure to be on your show because people on this show know so much about the subject. Yeah, you know what? As I've said many of times, the one thing I absolutely love about our audience is they make me bring the best every night that I possibly can. And even if I'm only running at 50%, like I was a couple of weeks ago when I was sick, I don't want to let them down. So no, I have no. to continue to perform. You know, And you know the beautiful part about it is, because we are one of the only shows that is truly interactive with our audience, they bring a lot of good questions to the table through the multi-chat rooms that we are using here for the broadcast. And they make it a lot more fun because the audience may be thinking of something that I haven't even thought of yet. So if there's a good question out there, which I would say 99.9 of them are, I want to use them. That's and right. you know what? 
and guests like yourself, Rod, have actually, after the show, when I talk to the guest, and you know I always talk to you right after the show, just to make sure you had a good time, that is probably one of the biggest compliments I get from our audience or from our guests is that our audience participation is just brilliant. I want to start off with a question from Catherine in the Spaced Out Radio chat room. Are leprechauns tricksters? Uh, all, all denizens of the fairy world are tricksters. Going back to the notion of the, uh, the pot of gold, that is one of the, 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 the keys uh, that this is a trickster. Um, now, the idea of a pot of gold is relatively new. Uh, the idea of finding a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow says a lot, because you can never really track down a rainbow, can you? You can never find its source. There is really no source. It's an illusion to begin with. So the idea that the pot of gold lies at the end of the rainbow is a, uh, is a tip-off that this, this guy is a trickster. And uh, he has been known uh, in folklore that he, if he is captured, uh, he is supposed to give up his fortune. And sometimes he would do this by alerting, to you, alerting you where his gold is buried by tying a, uh, a ribbon around a tree. And people have been known to capture him. He promises that he will show where his gold is by tying a ribbon around a tree. And he goes about tying a ribbon around every single tree in the forest. These are the kind of little anecdotal things that we have whenever we're talking about uh, the leprechaun. But uh, it, as we talk about fairies and the things that fairies can do, we always are going to have a trickster element to it. That's just the nature of these creatures. They are fickle, and whenever you think of them being um, personifications of the natural world, when we think about the fickleness of nature, uh, that is the way we should approach the world of the fairy, because these are very much beings of the natural world. Um, that being said, they've also been known to be beneficial. Um, the reason why uh, they are called, you know, they're seen with a shoe or a shoemaker is they have been, by tradition, uh, the, the cobblers to the fairies. Um, uh, William Butler Yeats said that the uh, fairies wear out their shoes so much from dancing that it's up to the leprechaun to fix them. And that's why we see the leprechaun always fixing the fairies' shoes. And apparently they charge a good bit of money because they, they seem to be quite wealthy creatures. But they have been known that if somebody is of pure of heart, uh, usually children or the elderly, they will bestow on them wealth as long as you're not trying to get one over on them. And that's also a very common element in the, in the world of the fairy. But, uh, yes, definitely tricksters. Uh, if one would ever stumble upon a, a leprechaun, um, they have been known to uh, uh, turn invisible uh, to escape your, your grasp. But if one would ever come upon a, a leprechaun, it's better it's better not try to catch catch this creature. Uh, just pass upon your merry way, which a lot of people have said in folklore that um, leprechauns are seldom seen, but they're heard. They're heard whistling. Uh, they've been known to play tin pipes or drums or harps or, of course, like we said, the hammering in of their nails as they're doing their cobbling work on the uh, on their shoes. So um, it's better to hear them than to see them, because then if you see them, there might be some sort of interaction. And interaction with the fairy world and the human world very rarely ends up well. Mm-hmm. New listener in the Spaced Out Radio chat room, Tony has an interesting question for you okay and and moments ago we were talking about portals sure if a if a portal shows up can you walk into it yeah see excellent question there my friend and i'm glad that to see i'm glad that he uh brought this up because i know that we're talking about uh leprechauns but when we talk about portals that's something that is important for for uh in my research um so let's talk about portals for a second. Can you go into them? 
yes, you can go into them. And there are prohibitions against it in Legends of the Fairy, isn't there? If you see a fairy ring, um, whether it be flowers, indentations in the grass, uh, usually mushroom rings, something along those lines, some sort of evidence that fairies had been there, you should avoid them because people have been known to step within that ring and disappear and either never seen again or seen again after seven years, after a certain amount of time has passed. But yes, portals can definitely take a person out of this world. Um, the, the gentleman that I spoke with about before, uh, Reverend Kirk up in Scotland, was believed to step into a fairy portal and never be seen again, but he did this willingly. Now, Taking this by extension, if we do not know where these portals are, if these are definitely locations of an earth energy that can open up doors from one dimension into another, then we must be very wary about what, where, what we're doing, shouldn't we? People go out hiking and are never seen again. And, you know, you have to question what may have happened. Did they, did they encounter the world of the fairy? Did they encounter a cryptid? What might have happened? So your mind starts wondering whenever you think of things like missing persons or even lost time. You know, that's another uh, a great uh, topic to discuss in relation to the world of the fairy, that people re report having lost time with alien abductions, but so too with uh, fairy encounters because you're taken to another place and time passes um, at a different pace uh, in, in that area. But yes, uh, uh, and that's why whenever I keep on talking about uh, when we look at the uh, the Neolithic uh, and the Bronze Age structures around the world that form these circular patterns like Stonehenge and like Avebury and great stone circles in um, in Scotland. And also in the Americas, we see that uh, the Navajo had these great medicine rings, these, these circular patterns. It's my it's my um, uh, contention that these patterns, like many many crop circles that you see, um, is an earth energy, or at least a marking of an earth energy that a human was able to experience in one way or the other. And this is a monument to those energies. And uh, people would come here because there is great power there, and whether it was used for healing. Or you know, in, in, or a way to uh, to commune with the gods, so to speak. Uh, it's always fascinated me why we keep on seeing these circular, cyclic patterns appearing in architecture uh, around the world, from like I said, from the from the Neolithic up into uh, you know the, the 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 Bronze Age, the Iron Age. We still see these uh, these type of uh, patterns existing until civilization has really crept in and kind of started. To to tame uh, the wild and the uh, the uh, the forested areas. So yes, I, I do believe if you found yourself a portal, that you would be able to step from one dimension into the next. If you ever saw a portal in front of you, would you walk in? Uh, yeah, no. actually, I'm working do, do, with. Do yeah, you think I'm it would be like field, field of Dreams? Or Stargate, <laughs> one of those two, I think. Um, I probably would not, but uh, that's an interesting point because I also belong to uh, a research organization called uh, the Center for Cryptozoological Studies, and I would urge any of your listeners to go over to uh, their website and take a look at it. But uh, one of my good friends and uh, the founder of that organization um, is trying to find a way to go about measuring these earth fluctuations so we can scientifically prove that these things exist. Um, because as I said before, I truly believe that there can be um, a, a healthy relationship between the paranormal world and the world of science. And we simply need to work within the paradigms of science so if we are ever scrutinized by science, we can, you know, we can prove ourselves, um, and I, th I think that's that's in my research. That's one of the things I really strive to do. Um, but if we are able to prove that there is an electromagnetic influx in certain areas, 
or you know if there's a, a gravitational change or if there's a, a, a shift in the in, in the in the in the Doppler in that area if something is measurable going on then we might be able to actually pinpoint where these naturally occurring um, uh, you know openings in the in the time and space uh, exist so that's one of the ongoing researches that I will be continuing for for at least a while my friend we are talking with the crypto guru, Little Ronnie O'Murphy, tonight on Base Out Radio as it's St. Patrick's Day. We're talking all things fairy, leprechauns, and more. Ron, what is the difference between a gnome and a leprechaun? <laughs> it's, it, it, to me, it, it's the same thing. It just depends upon where you are. And that's another good road to go down in our talking uh, of the uh, of, of the leprechaun, because their their characteristics are so sl- similar to that of the gnome or even the dwarf. Um, if you would go to the Teutonic folklore, um, you would see that these creatures live underground. They're known for mining. They're known for accumulating a great deal of wealth. And so, to the leprechaun, they're known to to live in caves, uh, to use um, you know use some sort of fairy magic to block the entrance uh, to their underground dwelling. Um, so we do have similarities. Um, we also have a, a you know the, the size too. Um, uh, leprechauns can be anywhere from six inches tall to twenty four inches tall. They're very very small. Same way with the gnomes. Same way with uh, with the idea of uh, of dwarves and things of, uh, of that nature. So I think we're talking one and the same. It's just uh, the cultures. Uh, the culture's perspective of each individual uh, uh, element, we should say. Because we have to understand that in the Renaissance, the great uh, – uh, I, 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 he's a little bit of everything, an alchemist, uh, a scientist, an anatomist, a botanist, but Paracelsus, he's the one that really started to, 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 to attempt to categorize what the fairy realm was, and he called them elementals. And I think that that's a good uh, place to start when we talk about the world of the fairy, is elementals, because he believed they existed in the air, in the water, in the earth, you know, in the ether, you know, and they were everywhere, but they could be categorized and, uh, and fitted into nice little, uh, into little uh, schemes within the, uh, within the environment. So if we talk about creatures of the forest, they would be known as sylphs uh, and uh and he saw them as you know being elements that they that they, that they actually made up uh the 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 nature that we see around them and they are kind of the personifications of the forces that work within the natural environment and if that is the case if we go on paracelsus's uh, uh labeling then um our from the leprechaun is is one and the same with the idea of the gnome because they are of the same essence when it comes to leprechauns, Joe in Paranormal Into the Night, I think, has a great question. He's got quite the sense of humor. He's saying, Ron, if I leave my shoes out in the woods, will they get repaired? <laughs> well, that's a, they, 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 they're, they're known to use nails and, and traditional type of, uh, of uh, uh, fixing materials. So I would say that if he has any clogs around possibility but if he sets his nikes out there i don't think the leprechaun has any hot glue guns in his back pocket but i could be wrong i would give it a shot and see what happens set a game camera up along the trail and see if you can find anything happening well hold on a second here nike is made in china now so are there chinese leprechauns that will do this (laughs) there there are little folks uh in every culture uh even in Hawaii, they they have a, uh, the idea of uh, of little people. Uh, that is a common element from around the world. So so yes, that is absolutely the case. On a more serious note, we tend to think of leprechauns being from Ireland and patrolling Great Britain or in the forests and and so on and so forth. But have there been sightings of leprechauns here in North America? <laughs> 
<laughs> there, there was a great sighting in North America and <laughs> Alabama of all places that actually uh, went viral whenever it, uh, it, it occurred. But yes, uh, a group of people uh, uh, reported that a, uh, a leprechaun visited their very inner city neighborhood one evening, and uh, it made for uh, for quite the spectacle. I think you can probably find it on YouTube. Look up Alabama um, uh, a leprechaun sighting. But people do see these things. Now, uh, but they're not going to be called uh, leprechauns unless we, we, we call them leprechauns. So if we see something uh, that is small and, you know, has a red beard and, and looks like the traditional leprechaun, we, of course, are going to call it that because there's a stereotype that's going to be followed. But if there is a small creature uh, that's very similar to the leprechaun in, in, the, in the Americas and in Canada, we don't necessarily – it's not necessarily a leprechaun. But it looks like one. So a lot of people kind of just throw that out there as a, as a stereotype. And I think that's a very important thing. So whenever we talk about are leprechauns indigenous to other places, uh, the answer is no. Leprechauns are completely Irish. But do creatures that resemble a leprechaun exist elsewhere? Absolutely. They ex- exist in mythologies all over the world. So would you say that this is a brother and sister version of the leprechaun from Ireland here? Or do uh, well, you for, think that because uh, – let me finish if you don't mind. Sure, if sure. You, or, do you, or do you believe, Ron, that because of these portals that are around, that the leprechauns from Ireland can actually show up here? Um, well, first of all, whenever we talk about uh, brothers and sisters, leprechauns have only been seen uh, from the from the, uh, the the male version. There's never been a female uh, uh, version of a leprechaun reported, which is very very interesting. Uh, they're they're said to live for hundreds of years, but um, I'm not sure exactly how the procreation takes place. Uh, some 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 folklorists state that uh, the uh, the leprechaun is the offspring of a fairy, except it's a deformed version of a fairy. That's interesting. I don't know if I give it much credence, but that's one of the theories out there. Um, But the idea of um, if if these are the same creatures and they're simply uh, uh, being transported by portals, I would say that that is closer to the truth. Um, Whenever we think of something like a Bigfoot, and I do uh, solemnly put Bigfoot in the realm of the fairy. Then we think of, the, of, of these kind of hairy creatures showing up in different places around the world. Um, I find it interesting that there's a Bigfoot creature in Australia called the Yowie. And how would something like that get there? Because, you know, uh, Australia has been separated uh, from, uh, from any other uh, uh, land mass for for millions of years. So you would think that a primate type of, of creature like that would have had to find its way there uh, by the same means that human beings did. And I don't foresee um, uh, a Bigfoot type creature uh, building a raft and getting to, our, or to getting to Australia. So how does one get there? And I think when we think of things like, um, like uh, portals, that makes perfect sense. And then whenever we look at the cultures in that area, like the Aboriginal cultures of Australia, they have a very keen knowledge of how the universe works, don't they? They have something called dream time, and they have these places that are sacred to them, like Ayers Rock. And these do seem to fall into this, the line of the idea of portals that we see in other cultures from around the world. So I would think that if, you know, you see a creature like a Bigfoot popping up in different places around the world, something is going on there that can can best be explained by um, using some sort of uh, uh, earth energies to get from one place to the other. We are talking with Ronald Murphy tonight on Spaced Out Radio, the crypto guru of Spaced Out Radio. Ron, I'm going to be honest with you. We have to somehow get you to copyright that for you because <laughs> other, pe- other people in the field now 
have notice, and they are actually calling you the crypto guru. They are. They are. So if anybody out there, if you have any um, trademark attorneys out there, I would greatly appreciate uh, any kind of input on how I can go about getting this uh, trademark. I would, I, I, I would appreciate it because uh, I absolutely love it. But yes, absolutely, people have caught on. So whenever I'm appearing on other radio shows, we inevitably bring up your name and your radio show because they want to know how I got the uh, I got this moniker. So it works out for both of us. I love it. I, I honestly <laughs> do, my friend. I do. Yeah, it, I, I, it, I, I it, like it, to. I like to appear on other shows, and for the first five minutes, we're talking about Dave Scott and Space Out Radio. I don't mind that at all. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now. I, I I don't mind that at all. You know. <laughs> You know, I mean, what am I supposed to do? I, I'm sitting here laughing right now. That's true. Because, because, oh, I love it too, my yeah. friend. I love it too. No problems. The funny part is, when I worked in terrestrial radio, you did absolutely everything in the edit booth. If someone you were interviewing brought up another radio station, you're like, oh, darn it, that's such a good clip. Now I have to go in there and edit saying the competition's name out of there because you just can't have that happen you know so when i hear of of you going on other shows and mentioning space out radio i'm like yeah free advertising that's, <laughs> that's right that's, that's exactly right. well i mean the thing is there's plenty of room for everybody out there isn't there but there's there's only a few shows that are actually worth listening to and and that's my thing is that the reason i am so enthralled by your show is because it is a pleasure to listen to no matter what the topic there are some topics you have on there that really aren't my cup of tea or my expertise but i still enjoy listening to them because you know the forum is such a, a great place when people are asking all these kind of diverse questions but you know i'm sure that you understand and your listeners understand that you listen to some of these shows that are you know four hours long and you're sitting there for like two hours in absolute agony waiting to the one guest is over so the other one comes on but the thing i like about your show is that it moves so quickly i mean uh looking at the clock we're already more than half over uh you know it, it, and it's been fun it's been a fun ride and uh but yes yeah, some of those shows are are like like listening to somebody having their teeth pulled it, it just goes on and on it's interminable but uh yeah that's the reason i like your show and i'm sticking with your show and i hope for the best things for you in uh 2016 thank you thank you buddy we are talking with the crypto guru little ronnie o'murphy tonight on space out radio hey it's saint patty's day he's irish he's into the swill he's got his red hair sparkling up and we'll be back for hour number two right after this you're listening to space out radio i am your host dave scott talk to you on the other side the phoenix lights roswell secret military aircraft, flying saucers. Let's check out the sky together. Hi, this is Rich Giordano, host of the AZ UFO show right here on the Spaced Out Radio Network. Every Sunday night at 7, we hit the airwaves to talk about the phenomenon of unidentified flying objects and more. We want to hear your stories. Maybe you've seen what many others have seen. Only one way to find out, the AZ UFO show on Sunday nights on the Spaced Out Radio Network on spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is James Tyson, host of Spaced Out Weekends, and I know you're enjoying tonight's show with Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio. I just wanted to remind you that Spaced Out Radio continues on the weekends with me. On Spaced Out Weekend, we hit the airwaves at www.spacedoutradio.com starting at 10 p.m. Pacific, 1 a.m. Eastern. We have great guests with interesting chats regarding all things paranormal, supernatural, cryptozoological, and much, much more. So tune in to Spaced Out Weekend and give us a listen. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. Need a break but don't have the time? 
tired of life's running around? Hi, this is Jolene from Rivula Relaxation and Readings. Let me help you in your time of need. From Reiki to Realm Readings, I can help provide you therapy for your mind, body, and soul. Check out my website at rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivuletrnr. And if you're a listener of Spaced Out Radio, receive 10% off your first session. Rivulet Relaxation and Readings. And don't forget to give my Facebook page a like. It's time for you to make some important time for you. The Spaced Out Radio Network can be found at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott. Here you can join the latest on our weekly shows and news from around the world involving UFOs, cover-ups, cryptids, ghosts, and more. Read articles from our very talented staff and check out our weekly tarot card reading from psychic Catherine. You can also sign up for free on our forum and tell us about your experiences. SpacedOutRadio.com. Always live, always interactive. The Webster Phenomena airs on Spaced Out Radio on Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. I'm your host, Patrick Webster Small, and I discovered extraterrestrials in the atmosphere, which led me to more discoveries developing the Webster Phenomena, which is the occurrence of extraterrestrials throughout nature. I will explain the Webster Phenomena and all my recent discoveries every Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time, right here on Spaced Out Radio. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Want to call in to Spaced Out Radio? You can. 1-607-203-5344. You can tweet us at Spaced Out Radio or send us a message on Facebook at Spaced Out Radio. And now, back to the show, here's Dave Scott. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio tonight. How y'all doing? Good to have you here. Paranormal into the night, Paranormal Forum. Space Out Radio chat room packed again. Thank you so much for being with us late on this Thursday night. We have one hour to go in St. Patty's Day. Hope you still got your green on. Spreaker update. Very important to our listeners. Either as early as this Monday, the 21st, or Monday, March 28th. At the latest, we will be going over to Spreaker. There will be no more blog talk radio. I am reminding you every commercial break, every night, as well as on social media, to be prepared. I know there's a lot of people who listen to this show who come in maybe once a week, twice a week, or once every couple of weeks to catch an episode. I need you to spread the word, our loyal listeners, that we are moving over to Spreaker. And the reason why is I don't want people to get lost saying, you know, where are they? They're not on Blog Talk Radio anymore. Is the show gone? We don't want to lose listeners. We want to make sure that we take care of you. It is better sound, better audio. We have a new look website, and we are 99% ready to make the move. We're just waiting for a couple of more audio commercials to come in, and when those come in, we are going to be making the switch over. I will keep you in touch with where we are this Monday, and if it is the following Monday, the 28th, that we are going to launch, I will let you all know. But tell everybody, if you haven't seen them in the Spaced Out Radio chat room or Paranormal Into the Night or Paranormal Forum in a long time, they're fans of this show, they're listeners of this show, I want you to remind them. If you could do me that favor, I would greatly appreciate it. Spread the word on your Facebook, on your Twitter, on your Instagram. Get the message out. Thank you. Tomorrow night on the show, Jim Vieira will join us. We are going to be talking about the lost colony of Roanoke. This is going to be an interesting show because this colony in the 1700s just up and vanished. We'll get to that tomorrow night on Spaced Out Radio. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. You can give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can also join us on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R. Our YouTube channel, where our archives will be stored, is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, if you want to check out the new look that has been there for two weeks this week. 
Tonight we are talking with the crypto guru. He's an Irish fellow of this show, a good friend. Little Ronnie O'Murphy, the crypto guru, joins us tonight. Ron, thank you so much for being with us. I can't believe we're already an hour in. Exactly. One, uh, less than an hour to go. How quick does that go? I want to start off with more leprechaun talk because it is the topic du jour being St. Patrick's Day. Do you believe that they are real or do you believe that they are just of legend? Um, I think that the bases of these creatures are genuine. I truly do. Um, but I think the attributes assigned to them are the things of legend. Um, whenever we talk about the pot of gold, whenever we talk about uh, their traditional clothes, wearing green, you know, the, 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 the shiny uh, belt buckles, the tri-corner hat, I think these are all things of make-believe. Uh, one of the telling aspects of uh, studying the folklore of the leprechaun is their attribute is of them smoking a pipe. Now, if if these are the creatures embedded within um, Irish mythology, then I, I doubt that they would have waited to take up the habit of pipe smoking until um, you know the uh, the the planting and the bringing over of uh, tobacco uh, from the colonies. So we, we we have to have the the founding of Jamestown in 1607 before that they would be introduced to tobacco. However, getting back to the whole idea of portals again, right, that we do see them transcending time and space. So that's also a very interesting thing. So whenever I started to, to study uh, the, uh, the myth behind the uh, leprechaun, I found that uh, the idea of them smoking a pipe was one of the most unusual aspects, and there, so there would be a history, so we can place them into history, um, that that they are, are, are you know, that they're, they're partaking of tobacco at the same time whenever their European counterparts uh, partook of tobacco as well. So I would think that these attributes are all assigned to them by the culture in which uh, they exist at that particular moment. But um, as far as are they actual living elemental creatures, I say yes, I truly do. I, I do think that they exist within the world, and I think that these elementals are um, are accountable for such things as uh, hauntings, as, as UFOs, and as certain cryptids from around the world. D in Space Cell Radio's Paranormal Into the Night chat room on Facebook is saying to you, Ron, if you want to copyright the crypto guru, it's only about 120 bucks on LegalZoom. I saw that, and I was so greatly appreciative of that kind of research. So I'm going to endeavor by the next time that we talk to have that as my copyright. That's what I'm going to be trying to do. That is awesome. Gail in Paranormal Into the Night has a question. Do you believe leprechauns or fairies are immortal? Um, people, uh, people being, you know, those that tell tells of these kind of creatures, uh, say that they live for hundreds of years. And usually whenever, um, uh, uh, a traditional rustic society, say they live for hundreds of years, that means that's being close to immortal. But, um, as far as, uh, the life cycle of, of a fairy, um, well, if, if they if they live in an area or live in a dimension where time is different than ours, then then does immortality even really have a role in their existence? Uh, you know, do they live for hundreds of years or thousands of years, or does their dimension have no sense of time whatsoever so they are in their reality, immortal? That's a very interesting question, isn't it? But, um, you know, if they're never seen with a female counterpart, and if they are seen, you know, for such a long period of time, then I would think that there must be some notion of an advanced longevity to these creatures. But if there are elements, if they are things of the natural world, then I would assume that they live for as long as the elements exist. Um, and that is one of those fascinating things about the fairy world that we uh, every time we study it, there's more questions that are that are asked than answered. So, and, and that's the reason I and I love it so much. Elizabeth Anglin in the Space Out Radio chat room has a question for you. 
Now I just got to find where she put it. <laughs> oh, yes. Are leprechauns related to Eastern European domo boys? <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you what, these these guys really know their stuff, don't they? Um, when we're talking about um, house fairies or house elves, the th- interesting thing about a leprechaun is that they are rarely attached to a, 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 um, a house or a dwelling unless it is the wine cellar because like all good Irish people they are supposed to be uh, you know uh, uh, quite adept at imbibing but so they have been known to haunt wine cellars to uh, to get the spirits uh, but when we're talking about actual uh, beings associated with habitations this is really not the domain of the leprechaun so when we talk about these other kind of spirits um, I would think that uh, as far as relations, possibly of the same metaphysical substance, but uh, the leprechaun and, uh, and the, the, the Eastern European uh, little guys are not analogous for a one-on-one binary correspondence, no. I hope I didn't lose you. No, you didn't. Oh, okay, good. You're there. Okay, good. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, that's yeah. all. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I was just, Oh, no, I, 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 I've been abducted. I <laughs> no, I, I'll be honest with you. I was coughing. I'm still trying to get over that. Oh, right. Here. Oh, that's right. That's right. You're still fighting that. Yeah, I hope one of these days. All I know is that I'm off to Las Vegas in three weeks for my Guns N' Roses trip, and it better not be with me then. It oh, better it not better, be with it me. It definitely will not be. And I'll tell you what, once you're done with that concert, please uh, 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 tweet us out or send us out a uh, set list because I'm curious about what they're going to be playing. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure old Davey will be doing something, live tweeting or something along those lines. And I'll have you there with spirit. Maybe what I'll do, Ron, is I'll actually call you from the show so you can listen in. I I would absolutely love that. And I'll tell you, let's see if we can get uh, Axel Rose on the show sometime. I'm sure that he has an interest in the paranormal, and this would be great. Well, he is an odd duck, that's for sure. (laughs) Yes, he is. Weird. I'm sure that they've all seen a couple fairies in their lives. Yes, I think back in the heroin days of the 80s, it would have been pretty good. (laughs) Here's another interesting question from the Space O Radio chat room from Elizabeth. Do leprechauns become attracted to people who search for treasure? Uh, People uh, become attracted to leprechauns who search for treasure, not the other way around, because they really do not want to have any kind of interaction with people because people like to take things. Um, so if we extend this to the reality behind the legend, uh, we look at fairies and uh, leprechauns that live in the woods. And human beings usually see the woods as a place where they can eventually dominate. So when we're talking about the truth behind the legends, uh, that is usually what is going on here. That, that, that the leprechaun represents the wild places and humans represent the the civilized places and they usually do not get along so i would think that people who hunt treasure are more attracted to the idea of the leprechaun because they are are known to hoard treasure so but not the other way around because leprechauns are not going to uh seek out the treasure hunter because the treasure hunter might actually find their pot of gold Hmm. That pot of gold is pretty important. It is. It's very, very important. And it's also important from a great folkloric uh, idea as well. Um, gold and hordes of gold have been associated with a lot of different types of creatures. And going back to uh, dragons, for instance, um, dragons have been known to, uh, you know, lord over great treasure troves. Whenever we think of Smog and, and the Hobbit, you know, and he's just, you know, he lives in a subterranean world, you know, guarding this great treasure that he has stolen. So 
whenever you think about what is the truth behind these kind of legends, there is an analogy to the natural world and to science regarding this. Um, whenever you look at places like Mongolia and the vast um, fossil fields there, you do at times come upon um, uh, usually fossilized remains of uh, protoceratops, and in the certain um, uh, certain environments, uh, you don't have to dig for fossils. They are right on top of the surface. So in places like Mongolia, there are fields where you can find protoceratops bones in the same area and sometimes in the exact same location as gold deposits. So mainstream science and mainstream uh, folklorists I uh, think that there is a correspondence between that legend and the legend of the dragon because a protoceratops looks pretty dragon-like. I do buy into that. I think that's a great idea. I think that that makes a lot of sense. However, whenever you're dealing with uh, the gnome and the, uh, and the uh, leprechaun, where do these kind of legends come into place? Now, if we are going to say yes, we can think that the legend originated from finding um, dinosaur bones in relation to uh, gold deposits. So, by extension, are we to say that the legends of the little people in relation to gold also stem from finding some sort of remains in places that had gold? And that's interesting, isn't it? Because if you look at it, if you if you kind to uh, kind of um, really study uh, the idea of finding gold in certain places, uh, I wonder if these legends do uh, creep up because there were some sort of hard evidence found of these little creatures in association with uh, with deposits of gold or, 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 or silver or something along those lines. Jackie in the Space Out Radio chat room has a question for you. Why do leprechauns need money? Where do they spend their gold? <laughs> well, the, the theory is that they are taking the money from, from the fairy realm to um to uh basically uh you know fix their shoes so they're they're getting paid for being cobblers and apparently the fairies pay very very well but there are uh <laughs> at least in literature um there are something called goblin fairs uh so there are places in in literature where we find that there is markets where things can be can be spent uh where money can be spent so i guess if you think about the world of harry potter and he goes uh you know searching for uh his magic wand and all that other kind of stuff that there are these parallels in literature and in folklore and legend where um there are marketplaces uh for the fairy uh, and I guess there are places for these, you know, for money to be spent. But um, uh, it also can benefit people, as I, I've talked about in the very first hour, that if you are pure of heart and you do have actually um, a reason for needing money, uh, uh, leprechauns have been known to grant people money. So uh, if, if they are getting paid uh, by fairies, apparently you can find some generous leprechauns out there as well. At least that's what legend tells us. Elizabeth has a follow-up question to what you were talking about regarding the gold. Is it about the energy of gold, angelic energy, spiritual energy, abundance that attracts them? Um, okay, um, so let me see. What what was the question again? You're you're saying that they are attracted to the gold? Yeah. Is it about the energy of gold, angelic energy, or spiritual energy that attracts leprechauns to the gold? Well, if you if, if what we're going to say is that uh, there is a natural attraction to uh, from leprechauns to uh, the gold. Well, uh, gold is uh, uh, very uh, important in a lot of uh, uh, electrical circuitry, is, is it not? Uh, and so a lot of precious metals are. So if you would think along that lines, and that takes us back to the whole theory of the portals, so it's very possible that they are using gold for some sort of uh, production or harnessing of an electrical power. 
Yes, but that is very cool. That is a very cool thought. Bill from Paranormal End of the Night is asking, can leprechauns be attached to a family line and follow them throughout history? Uh, whenever we talk about um, uh, Ireland, you do definitely have um, um, attachments of fairies to certain people. But those usually dwell within the world of the Banshee. Now, it's interesting for the name Banshee because that comes from uh, uh, the, um, the compound word for a uh, female fairy, as a matter of fact. And banshees are definitely attached to families. But as far as a leprechaun being attached to a particular family, uh, leprechauns are by its very nature loners. So if a family is consistently seeing a leprechaun uh, through the ages, then I would, uh, I would think, that it would be my opinion, that the family has, is uh, close enough to that leprechaun's environment, and uh, they are just seeing it uh, serendipitously, and there's no true attachment to a particular family. And Joe, in, to, uh, in Paranormal Into the Night, has a question. Ron, what is your advice if you stumble across one in the woods? Because... He lives in the woods. Oh, right, right. Um, as I've said before, uh, I would I would never try an interaction with any of these uh, uh, fairy creatures. And if you would see a little person uh, out in the woods, uh, yeah, definitely, um, you know, take a picture if, if need be. But uh, do not try to capture it because, as, as, as history would tell us, things really go badly if uh, you do try to capture a leprechaun. And I think that it's, it's best that we all um, watch uh, uh, Jennifer Aniston's first movie called Leprechaun with the great actor Warwick Davis, and we would find out what happens if you would happen to take a leprechaun shilling. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Elizabeth in Space Out Radio's chat room is asking, she goes, okay, silly question. If a leprechaun likes you, like a little kid, do they help you find a four-leaf clover or something that is special to them? Oh right! Wow, that's a, it, it, that's the thing about uh, about uh, tonight's uh, talk as well too. Uh, there is a great uh, uh, mythology around the four-leaf clover, which is uh, you know typically Irish. So whenever we think about the leprechaun, we do immediately think of such talismans and charms and amulets as a four-leaf clover. And the four-leaf clover is this great um, mixture of the pagan and the Christian. Um, you know, tradition states that the four leaves, you know, represent faith, hope, and love, which is very, uh, you know, very uh, New Testament-based. This is, you know, right from the writings of the, uh, of the, uh, of the Apostle uh, Paul, isn't it? Faith, hope, and love. But the other uh, uh, leaf on the four-leaf clover represents something called luck. And luck is what every Irish person wants, isn't it? It's what gets us ahead in life. And and the leprechaun does have this attribute of luck attached to it, because if you can catch one and pin one down, your luck has changed for the better because you are able to get his pot of gold. You're able to get some sort of uh, financial gain out of it. But yes, intrinsically, the leprechaun and the notion of luck and four-leaf clovers are entwined because um, if one is bold enough to do it and attempt to capture a leprechaun, it is kind of like winning the Powerball if you're able to catch them. But, uh, you know, think about how few people do win the Powerball and win the lottery. And if you do win the lottery, sometimes that's not always a blessing, is it? You know, you have a lot of these horror stories about people that lose, you know, family and friends and basically are much worse after they gain wealth. And that is the a, a two-edged sword. Uh, and that's what uh, the, uh, the leprechaun represents. He is the two-edged sword to warn us what happens if we do seek uh, beyond all else wealth over uh, the more important things in life. I tell you right now, if I won the lottery, I am disappearing. Not from yeah. the radio, but in my personal life, like I was, it's weird that you bring that up because moments ago I was uh, checking uh, Paranormal into the night, and this advertisement came up for the lot lottery here in Canada, which is at sixty million dollars. 
All right. I win that. I win that. I'm gone. You'll hear me broadcasting from literally nowhere, in the middle of nowhere. You know, and that's as far as people will know, is literally nowhere. That's right. That's right. And isn't that something, too, whenever we think about it? Whenever we think about accumulating a great deal of wealth, we don't want to live in cities. Very few people want to live in cities. People say that they will leave, uh, you know, they'll leave the the urban setting behind and just retreat off into uh into the the wilderness and that is very leprechaun like you know he will take his wealth with him and he'll go where nobody else can find him so we are very much like leprechauns aren't we and i and i feel the exact same way with you if i would ever win that kind of sum of money i would definitely not move into any kind of city or town i would go out by myself in the middle of nowhere and write and be far away from people because people come sometimes can screw up your life more than a, an a leprechaun can. Oh, absolutely. We are talking with the crypto guru tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Little Ronnie O'Murphy is our guest tonight. Ron, I'm going to get you to hold on. We are going to hop out for our final break of the night. So, boom, there you go. He's back on hold just like that. Now you just have me. Well, I hope you like it at least. Ronald Murphy is a crypto guru. He comes on this show once a month. As of April, Ron will be coming on every second Wednesday of the month. So April 13th will be his next visitation, following in May by May 12th, and that's the rotation we are going to take. We're trying to get some continuity here as we move into Spreaker and get everything going and on track, and that way it's easier for you, the listener, as well to know when Ron and other guests that come on and make a monthly appearance are on the show. And you can find that out on our new look website, spaceoutradio.com. You're listening to Space Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be right back. Want to find out what's coming up on the Spaced Out Radio Network? Go to spacedoutradio.com where you can find our daily list of shows and guests appearing throughout the week. Want to tell us your story? Be sure to sign up for the Spaced Out Forum for free. Maybe you have a psychic question. Drop in and say hi to Catherine in Cat's Corner. Spacedoutradio.com, your 24-hour source for UFOs, ghosts, conspiracies, and more. Check it out today. Are you one of many who's had a UFO or ET experience? Listen up. The AZ UFO Show is on every Sunday night at 7 on the Spaced Out Radio Network. We talk about UFO sightings across the globe, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, and more with me, Rich Giordano. I want you to know what's going on in the skies above you, so tune in to the AZ UFO Show on Spaced Out Radio Network on spacedoutradio.com right before Spaced Out Weekend. Our show is literally out of this world. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Brand new discovery beats NASA. This is Patrick Webster Small bringing you the Webster Phenomena every Monday night at 8 p.m. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to talk about amazing stuff. Have amazing guests. That's all they is, man. You know the rest as E.T. is up in the sky. I'm going to tell you which way and why. 
And we're going to have a little combo about these ETs in the sky. We're going to chill. This is Patrick Webster Small, and I'll be seeing you every Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. Write it down on Spaced Out Radio. Is the 24-hour world starting to wear you down? Let me, from Rivulet Reiki and Ratings, lend you a hand. Hi, this is Jolene. And if you're in need of Reiki or a realm rating, come to my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivulet r and r and let us help you out at rivulet i specialize in healing your body mind and soul no matter where you are and be sure to check out the rivulet r and r facebook page for your best deals remember it's time for you to make some time for you hi there this is jim tyson host of spaced out weekend when you've had a busy week and you're just wanting to chill out and relax how about listening into my show that's right spaced out weekend i focus on the paranormal the arcane I even dip into the techie side of things and much, much more. And I would love for you to come in and check it out. Remember, Spaced Out Radio goes seven days a week. Dave Scott, Monday through Friday, and me, Jim Tyson, rolling through the weekends. I look forward to having you stop by for a listen every Saturday and Sunday night, 1 a.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific, only on Spaced Out Radio. Miss most of tonight's show? Don't worry, you didn't miss a thing. You can head to our website, where you can download the podcast at spacedoutradio.com. Now, back to tonight's show. Here's Dave Scott. We've rounded third. We're headed for home on Spaced Out Radio tonight. Another show flying by with the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy. Spreaker alert. I know you've heard me say this the past couple of breaks, but if you're just tuning in, I do want to fill you in. We are moving to Spreaker either March 21st or March 28th, 28th at the latest. We will no longer be broadcasting off of our format of Blog Talk Radio. We are done here. We are just waiting for some final audio to come in for commercials and promos. When that comes in, we will put it all together. We will put it into our new studios in Spreaker, and we are broadcasting. As of April 18th, Space Out Radio will go to three hours. The first hour will be hosted by Ivan Palermo. And on Space Out Weekend, the first hour will be hosted by Cosmic Passports' Elizabeth Anglin. We have a release that we wrote out today. It is on the Space Out Radio group as well as my personal Facebook page on Instagram as well. So I highly suggest you start telling everybody who is a fan of this show, whether they come in every night, like most of you, whether they come in once a week, once a month, remind them, and I need your help here, remind them to go to Spreaker, follow us on Spreaker, and remind them that we are no longer on Blog Talk Radio. We don't want to forget any of our fans. Tomorrow night on the show, we will be talking about the Roanoke colony that just vanished off the face of the earth. Jim Vieira will be our guest tomorrow night on Spaced Out Radio. If you're on social media and on Twitter, you can follow us at Spaced Out Radio. On Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed Dave Scott, S-O-R. Our YouTube channel is Spaced Out Radio Show, and our new look website is spacedoutradio.com. Now, for the final time tonight, we bring in little Ronnie O'Murphy, the crypto guru of Space Out Radio, making his monthly appearance tonight. Of course, we're talking leprechauns, we're talking little people, we're talking gnomes. Ron, welcome back. Hey, thank you very much, and I cannot wait till tomorrow's program. That is going to be a great show. I, cannot, I, I will be there, my friend. Well, thank you very much. You know, being on the west coast of Canada... A lot of these topics that happened in the East Coast of the United States are quite foreign to us. And when I started researching this one, I was kind of blown away by this colony just all all of a sudden up and disappearing, much like Atlantis did. It's kind of weird. It is very, very weird. And you have a very able guest uh, to talk about that. So, yeah, it's going to be a really good show. Well, tonight is about you being with your Irish heritage. See, here in BC, you still have 27 minutes to celebrate. Do you, still have, any gr- do you, do you still have any green on tonight? 
Oh, you always, always have green on. You got to, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a, a green shirt, as a matter of fact. Very nice. I had a green shirt on earlier. Now nice. I got my hello. Now I have my hello Cleveland shirt from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, that's right. You do get around a good bit there, don't you? Uh, so yeah, I try. <laughs> yeah. I try. I ha- I haven't traveled much very much over the last couple of years, you know, because uh, little SOR was born in 2013, and then my personal experiences just started coming up, and then I started this radio show on a nightly basis. And right. it's a little it's a little bit difficult to get around, but this year we're going to do a little bit of traveling. And, um, you know, I don't think we're hitting the East Coast this year, but probably next year we'll be back on track to make a way out your way. Well, I'll be looking forward to finally meeting you. I used to travel a good bit as well, too, until, of course, kids come along, and that kind of threw a, uh, a wrench into that uh, into those works. But, yeah, I still try to get around a good bit, but not as far out as uh, where you guys are at. Whenever you talk about it being another, uh, another country uh, where we're at on the East Coast here, same way, my friend, and it's a shame. But uh, thank goodness there's uh, radio shows like this where we can kind of bring everybody together. Mhm. Absolutely. And we really appreciate you taking your time to join us on a monthly basis because you're just such an expert on everything. And yeah, I'm kissing your ass a little bit. I don't mind saying that, <laughs> but I really do appreciate, you know, that this working relationship that you have with Spaced Out Radio is not just a working relationship. It's actually turned into a pretty cool friendship. And, you know, I've had that happen with a few guests but it's it's part of the job that I like where we try and make this a family event every night. And when groups like Paranormal Into the Night or Paranormal Forum or everybody who's been showing up in the Space Out Radio chat room for well over a year since we started this show, it's become more like family where I see all of you more than I actually see my own wife and kids during the day, as sad as that sounds. But without Mrs. Space Out Radio support and love and admiration for what this show is and what it means to me, I wouldn't be doing this. So I'm pretty lucky, much like you got a good wife at home who allows you to fulfill your dreams as a writer as well. Well, you know what? Uh, it, it was funny because my uh, my uh, youngest daughter, Willow, who is, uh, who's uh, 10 years old, uh, she will get on my case every now and then because, you know, writing a book – or writing anything does require a lot of time. And uh, there is sacrifice that your family does make for your passion. That is absolutely the case. And occasionally, you know, she becomes a little bit irritated because I'm not around as much because I'm, I'm, I'm doing my work. And then sometimes she'll say, why are you writing that, Daddy? You know none of this stuff is real. So she's a little skeptic, you know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, definitely whenever you talk about uh, your family being behind you, you definitely 100% need that because if you don't have it, uh, you're not gonna you're not going to get ahead. You're just not going to do it. A lot of people, especially, Ron, as we bring the conversation back into tonight's interview, if they're of American Indian descent or First Nations descent up here in Canada, they have had experiences, and many First Nations people will not even discuss the fact that there are little people, tribes, in the mountains. They are said to be all over the Aleutians. They are said to be in the Rocky Mountains. British Columbia here has a lot of mountainous areas as well that are said to hold little people cities. Do you believe that the little people are existing, number one? And number two, are they tied into the whole folklore of leprechauns and gnomes? Yeah, you know, and I, that's what I was uh, actually um, uh, making a point, but you did it much more eloquently than I did, that whenever we talked about finding uh, the remains of dinosaur bones around gold deposits, I think it's very possible that um, the relation between uh, the pot of gold and the leprechaun had some sort of correlation historically to finding some sort of remains 
uh, of of either a little person or you know the 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 uh, the uh, artifices of a little person around some sort of wealth deposit, um, and I think that that is uh, a very likely scenario whenever you think about so many native cultures around the world that have little people uh, mythologies, and when when you think about it, that um, there have been. Uh, discoveries in Ireland of what appears to be, you know, clothing, small shoes from uh, a very, very small, apparently humanoid. Um, people used to find uh, small arrowheads and call them uh, a fairy point. So people have found remains of very uh, of, of a culture that is very, very small, and I think that that does have a tendency to play into these myths. Sorry about that. I had to cough. But yes, I actually do think that there is a correlation between actual existing um, uh, tribe of, of of little people and our notion of of uh, fairies and leprechauns as well. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I have issues with with a lot of scientific researchers who look into the crypto field is, in my opinion, and my opinion only. There are way too many what I like to call Caucasian Christian science researchers out there who absolutely do not and will not take First Nations or American Indian accounts of little people, of Bigfoot, of any sort of creature into their research. Do you think this is right or wrong in thinking? when you are looking into whether or not Dogman or Bigfoot or Leprechauns or Little People exist? Um, Well, a lot of people claim it to be ethnocentric. I mean, that's the polite term academia uses. But I think whenever we're dealing with people simply disregarding um, folklore of a culture because of of its you know because of its indigenous of its an indigenous culture you have to start you know banning about the term racism at that point and I do see institutionalized racism in a lot of different aspects of archaeology and anthropology that until the white man got a hold of a culture that that culture really didn't make any kind of sense um, so we automatically I do it myself too because that's just the way that I was trained to do we kind of put our own perspective into that culture and that is definitely the wrong thing to do so in the last several years what I've been doing whenever I'm studying folklore is I take it from its face value first and foremost and find out what value that particular culture had in it now we of course can um can study the different cultures and find parallels between cultures and and I'm a I'm a, a, a very uh a Jungian uh, structuralist whenever it comes to my studies. So I truly do think that there is a collective unconscious out there that links everybody together, and there is this notion of structuralism that we have uh, uh, this world and the other world, and they kind of complement each other. But, um, yes, definitely 100% that we must not look at uh, cultures through the lens of uh, 21st century, uh, you know, uh, Europeans. It, it can't happen anymore. It, it must stop. Uh, we are losing uh, languages every single day. And uh, not only when we lose languages, we uh, lose also their, uh, their way of transmitting their folklore. So a lot of this stuff is disappearing because we are not, uh, we're not giving it any kind of credence or any kind of weight. This stuff is very, very valuable. Uh, the language of a people is like its library, and, you know, and, and, and the books are the tells that they tell. So we must not you know, uh, think that um, these are not of any value because it's not written in our language or it's not spoken in our language. So, yes, we must not be ethnocentric. We must not be uh, what I really term as a racism uh, we cannot view uh, uh, other cultures like this at all. They had value in this folklore, and they had value in this legends. So if this stuff does not exist, we must figure out why they had such a value in it. And that's what I like to do in my research, is find out why certain cultures valued the tells that they tell. 
Getting back to the little people that First Nations and American Indians have seen and come across with, these little societies, from what I have learned, are not to be bugged. They are not very pleasant to deal with. And no, I'm not talking about what happened to Gulliver and Gulliver's travels here. But have you heard the same thing along those lines in your research of the little people? Oh, sure. Uh, and uh, somebody on your uh, paranormal into the night had uh, put up a little picture of a puck wedgie, and it seems to be a very militaristic type of creature, you know. And so whenever we see um, any culture uh, coming upon um, the culture of the little people, there is invariably some sort of clash. Uh, and I think that, that is because we see anything that is outside of ourselves as something that can be controlled. And if something is diminutive, speaking of structuralism that I like to, to use, that uh, you know we are the big people, they're the little people, so obviously we have mastery over it. And I think that people tend to think in that way. It's uh, very, um, very uh, consoling to the human psyche to think that we are uh, the, uh, the zenith of creations, that we are the apex uh, culture. And when we say something that we deem lower than ourselves, we think that we can control it. And uh, I think that that has happened since the very beginning of time. And if these, if these little people cultures actually did exist, then um, absolutely, uh, it is just a natural part of the human, uh, human mind to want to subjugate these 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 uh, beings, and that's a, a very sad commentary on who we are as a people. Roz in Paranormal Forum would like to ask you, what are your thoughts on Bigfoot then being like the real predator, like in the movie, without killing of humans? Oh wow, that's I I've never thought about that before. Uh, so are we talking about uh, the predator as in that he is the predator of, of, of the fairy world or, or exactly no, what are we talking like about a, here? Like the movie Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger oh. and Jesse Ventura? Sure. Oh, oh, I absolutely remember that, of course. Uh, so um, let's see here. I don't see him quite as uh, hostile as, as the predator was, um, but are we talking about like the uh, – the ability to cloak and the, that it came from someplace else. People are talking about uh, Bigfoot cloaking now all the time, that sometimes it even appears pixelated. And that's the reason why it's not showing up on cameras or we get something called a, blo a blob squatch. I think that there is something to be said about that. And I think that we that these creatures are able to produce a natural energy simply because they are not part of this realm. So I think that whenever we see them manifested in our reality, that they are actually um, harnessing some sort of electricity, some sort of earth energy in order to be seen visibly to us. And I think that that's why they're not showing up very well on cameras. I truly think that that is a, a logical, um, uh, uh, a very plausible uh, excuse to why we don't have any very you know very good photographs of them, but yes, I think that there is a correlation to be made that uh, you know that the predator uh, in the movie was able to uh, get around the way he did because he could somehow mask his appearance and we do have that notion in the fairy world as well, and that is called glamour. Uh, fairies are notorious shapeshifters. They can make themselves appear of something else. Sometimes they can even mimic other people's voices the same way the predator did in the movie. So yes, I think that there is a uh, there's a, a very neat little correlation that that uh, that your uh, your guest had uh, made. I wouldn't say it's a one on one correlation that there's some sort of you know uh, uh, malevolent type creature. That's, that's hunting down people mm -hmm. in the forest, but I think that it's an interesting notion nonetheless, yes. I had a chat with Lyle Blackburn, the cryptozoologist out of Texas last week. and he'll I, I heard that, April yes. 7th. And, you know, he told me a really eerie story in regards to what Roz had asked. And he said there was a hunter down in Louisiana hunting feral pigs. And out of the corner of his eye from his tree stand, 
he saw something move from tree to tree, so he thought it was another hunter. So he put his gun down, thinking that he didn't want to shoot another human being. Well, sure. And, and the next thing he knows, he's watch, he notices that this creature is hairy, and he's standing silently in the tree, and he's watching a Bigfoot stalk these pigs. Then the Bigfoot jumps out on one of the bigger pigs, about a 250, 300-pound pig, picks it up, wallops it, its head into the side of a tree, killing it instantly, picks up the pig, and even though the creature did not make eye contact with the hunter, after the kill was made, the Bigfoot stood up, turned his head towards the hunter in the tree, growled and showed his teeth, then walked off with the pig. Yes, yes. I, I've my research has shown the exact same thing that people would be dressed out in the out in camouflage in the woods, and these creatures still know that there is uh, that there's a human being there. It's almost that there's a, like a, a, a an ESP type of uh, a quality to it that somehow it can actually sense that there is a human wavelength around. Um, it's either one. Uh, or the other. It's it's either they can actually sense us on a very psychic level, or number two is they're so used uh, to uh, their environment that it would be like as if we would step into our living room and there would be a Bigfoot attempting to hide in the corner. You know, it's one or the two. But, uh, you know, from the research that I've done and the people that I've talked to that have had experiences, it seems that there's something more to it than that. It seems like there is uh, some sort of primal communication at least between the the vibrations of what a human puts out and what these cryptids put out but it seems like they are aware that we are there long before we know that they're there Mm -hmm. i still think there is something to bigfoot when it comes to shape-shifting or being interdimensional. I know a lot of researchers do not agree with me on that one i know cosmic passport host Elizabeth Anglin does not agree with me on that, but I am convinced of it. I am totally right. convinced of it. Right. And what I say to people as well, too, because you have to understand, for about a decade, I was a tried and true uh, Bigfoot as a terrestrial animal, that there is nothing uh, in regard to anything interdimensional about these creatures, until I've started to do so much research. And, you know, trackway, trackways just simply vanish. People had, you know, fired guns upon these things, and they vanish. But um, because we are saying that there is an interdimensionality to it, does not mean that they are not of a physical corporeal body either. They can be both. They, I, I don't see any reasons why to think that they are not a regular flesh and blood animal that exists in their own reality. And then whenever they come over here, that they are able to, uh, you know, uh, the physics change because they are in a reality that's far foreign to them. But yes, they they can be both. You know, they they can leave behind tracks. They can leave behind hair samples. You know, uh, because they are a terrestrial animal, just not in our reality. We are talking with the crypto guru Ronald Murphy tonight on Space Out Radio. You can find any of his books on Amazon.com. Very knowledgeable when it comes to the Fae and Dogman, whatever the crypto creature is, Ron is on top of it. Ron, a lot of people will remember the the children's book, Billy Goat's Gruff, where there's the troll under the bridge. Are you believing in trolls as well that live under a bridge or live in a forest or in trees or something along those lines that are still bugging and haunting and bullying people or other creatures? Well, it, that's another interesting point, especially when we're talking about uh, the idea of luck and, and talismans and things. Um, one of the great uh, uh, folkloric traditions is that there's always something to be encountered at crossroads or at bridges. This crossing from one place into another seems to be um, an area where fairies seem to congregate for whatever reason. And whenever you have the passage of something over water, that seems to be a very magical place. Now, when we talk about things like hauntings, 
a lot of hauntings exist around places where there's running water, and I feel that there's a there's a natural kinetic energy to uh, to to running water, and if these entities are indeed uh, manifesting off of Earth energies that uh, there might be a reason why these creatures are seen under bridges, and that's because they are using the energies, the natural energies from the water that flows under that bridge to manifest, to be able to be seen in some sort of corporeal form that we can actually view. And the tradition has has been uh, uh, handed down to us because they are using the water for uh, for uh, purposes of drawing an energy from it, and we are just naturally seeing them because we are crossing a bridge uh, that that crosses over uh, their world. Uh, it makes sense to me, uh, but I've talked to people even today in the 21st century in uh, you know in, in in Western Pennsylvania that have seen trolls under bridges, and the only uh, the only logical explanation that I can have is if I feel that they are not making up these stories, they're not lying, they're not hallucinating, then what is the reason why that they're seeing this? And I think it's because that the, the, these spirits, these elementals, these creatures, whatever you would like to call them, is using the natural earth energies uh, to uh, manifest in a form that we can see. Roz in Paranormal Forum is an American Indian descent, and he is say, saying in his belief, Bigfoot have strong men, uh, medicine that can actually make you forget that you've seen them. Yes, I, I, I've heard that many, many times, uh, and also uh, in the in the European fairy lore. The exact same thing happens, uh, and it also happens too in the uh, in the world of the extraterrestrial, does it not? So we are seeing uh, similar characteristics on these uh, various various cultures. Uh, so if we looked at the Celtic culture, if we look at the First Nations culture, if we look at you know certain African cultures, we see this idea of these creatures being able to induce some sort of hallucination or some sort of forgetfulness onto a person that has uh, been an eyewitness to them. That's something that actually follows very many different cultural uh, uh, lines. So there is something to that. The reason I feel that they are sharing these uh, attributes is because the creature that's being reported from one culture to another is one and the same. Ronald Murphy, we only got about two minutes left, buddy. It's that time I'm of the night you. where you tell... It's that time of the night where you got to tell people where they can find all your books, what your books are titled, and you got to call it that. the night. Yep, my, uh, my, my first research book that I had ever written was, actually came out last April, and it's called Unexplained World of the uh, Chestnut Ridge, and that's where I follow the Chestnut Ridge of western Pennsylvania and all the creepy crawly and all the strange tales that go along with that. Um, I also have a book out called The Pack, which is a novelization of the Dogman legend. You can find that on Amazon.com as well. But uh, this year is really going to be a big year in regards to research for for me, I have a book out uh, coming out within the month called On Mermaids, which is about mermaids, and uh, another book that I'm quite proud of that will be coming out in about two weeks is called On Dogmen, Tracking the Werewolf Through History. These are two research books that I worked a great deal of time on, over a year of time on each, researching them. Um, I also have a book uh, out uh, concerning ghosts of uh, Westmoreland County, a very regional book here uh, in West from Pennsylvania. But yes, I've got a lot of things going on, a lot of things coming out, but they will all be available at uh, Amazon.com. They can also be found at places like um, uh, uh, Barnes & Noble and everything. But I always give a name of uh, Amazon because Amazon absolutely has everything. It doesn't matter what part of the country or the world that you're in, you'll be able to find them. And I also urge any of your, uh, your, uh, your listeners to go to my Facebook page, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. Simply like that, and then I will be able to provide links or whatever. And we can also chat that way as well, too. I'm looking forward to talking to anybody off the radio as well. That's great to me, as too. Awesome. Ron, always a pleasure to have you on the air. We will talk to you next on April 13th, which is I a Wednesday wait. night, I second wait. Wednesday of the month. Me either, my friend. Good on you. We'll talk very soon, and happy birthday on Sunday from all of us at Space Out Radio and all of our listeners to you on Sunday.
Hey, thank you very much, guys. It was a great time. I'll see you guys next month. Take care. Bye-bye. Do you have a topic or guest you'd like to hear on Spaced Out Radio? Email us, dave at spacedoutradio.com. Send us a quick message on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio or a message on our Facebook page, Spaced Out Radio. Once again, here's Dave Scott. And once again, we want to say thanks to the crypto guru, Ronald O. Murphy, for coming on Space Out Radio tonight. His next appearance will be April 13th, every second Wednesday. Hey, we're moving to Spreaker, March 21st or March 28th at the latest. It'll be on a Monday. We will start it on a Monday. We're hoping to get there this Monday night. I will let you know on Space Out Weekend with James Tyson this weekend which day it will be. So stay tuned. Make sure you tune in to Space Out Weekend with James Tyson this weekend. Tomorrow night on the show, we're going to talk about the Lost Colony of Roanoke with Jim Vieira as our guest. Hey, if you want to follow us on Twitter, at Space Out Radio, Facebook, Space Out Radio Show, Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R, our YouTube channel is Space Out Radio Show, and our website is spaceoutradio.com. We will talk to you in exactly 22 hours from now. I'll be back in the hot seat before heading off into the wilderness for the weekend. Hope you can join me. Well, not on the wilderness. I like to do that alone. It's my zen time. Hey, have a good night. Thanks for tuning in. Much love to all of you.